Hi. In this video, we're going to be discussing the concept of hypothesis testing. So whenever we're doing research, it's really, really important that our results are not just going to be due to random chance. Now, the thing is that there's never any way of knowing whether or not your results are due to random chance. Uh, the randomness and the unpredictability of this universe simply means that well, there's always going to be cases where results show up that well, probably aren't valid. But the process of hypothesis testing is a really, really useful method to, to help alleviate that particular danger. So with any sort of scientific work, Again, it's going to be really important that we clearly define our experiments and our hypotheses that we want to test. And what we're going to have to do, no matter what type of experiment it is that we're looking at, when we set up our hypothesis portion, we always need to start with a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is basically what already exists. So if there's data that already exists or study that already exists, that's the null hypothesis. It's the statement of no change. And we have to assume that the null hypothesis is true until we have enough evidence to show otherwise. And we denote that null hypothesis as H0. The alternative hypothesis is really the statement that we're trying to find evidence to support. It's typically the whole reason we're doing our particular experiment. Now, when we run our hypothesis test, what we're doing is trying to find the probability that we arrive at our alternative hypothesis, as long as we assumed that the null hypothesis was true. So assuming that the previous research is correct, or assuming that things happen due to random chance, I suppose, would our results, therefore, well, what would the probability of getting our results actually be? And the probability of arriving at those results is our p-value. So doing hypothesis testing can typically be broken down into five steps. The first step is just to make sure you clearly define what you're investigating and then verify that your data is usable, which means your data has to be independent and approximately normal. Step two, you need to make sure that you state what your null and your alternative hypothesis are going to be, along with the level of significance that we're going to be using. And so we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then step three, we collect our data, and then we determine our point estimate, we calculate the standard error, we do all those things that we looked at back in chapter eight, and then we use probability to determine, well, the probability of obtaining our p-value, which is our probability of the alternative, hypothesis, and then we use either our normal curve distribution, if we have proportions, or that t distribution for sample means. But once we find our p-value in that probability, then we compare that p-value to our significance level, which we always denote as alpha. And again, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But essentially what we're trying to do is that if our probability is bigger than our level of significance, if the probability of obtaining our results is, is large, given that the null hypothesis is true, then we have to retain that null. There's not enough evidence to show that our data supports any other conclusion besides that original null hypothesis. However, if the probability or the p-value of our experiment is really small, that means the probability is a very small probability or it's very unlikely to happen, well, then compared to our level of significance, we can reject that null hypothesis. And we can actually state that, well, that the null hypothesis is, is not really true. We now have evidence to contradict what has been previously accepted as our, well, null hypothesis. And then step five is going to be to write a conclusion. So I want to worry about just the setting up the hypothesis testing first, then we'll talk about levels of significance. And so when we set up our hypothesis test, we typically follow the same type of process. And, and let's look at an, an example to, to help illustrate it. So GE claims that their new LED light bulb lasts for a thousand hours on average. 
A consumer advocate wants to know if the mean amount of time that the light bulb lasts is actually less than a thousand hours. Right? Would GE be kind of falsifying, you know, the the numbers about their product? And that's what consumer advocate groups do. So we need to set up first of all our null hypothesis, and our null hypothesis has to be, well, kind of what's already given to us. So our alternative or our null hypothesis, H0, is going to be that mu, or the mean, is 1,000 hours. Again, we have to accept that as true. We have to assume that's true from the beginning. And then what the researcher wants to investigate, his alternative hypothesis, H1, is that mu is actually less than 1,000 hours. It's actually smaller than 1,000 hours. When we do this type of test where it's less than, this is going to be a left tail test because what we're trying to show is that if we use our normal curve, that if the mean is at 1,000, we want to show that the probability of the mean being less than 1,000 is, well, statistically significant. Let's try another example. I want to set up the hypothesis test for uh, for this particular example. So in 2015, a poll found that 52% of Americans supported withdrawing troops from overseas. A researcher believes that that percentage is different today. Well, again, before you can show that that percentage is different, you need to assume the null hypothesis, which is that that proportion or that probability P is 0.52, right? The proportion of Americans is 0.52, and we have to assume that's true. But the researcher believes it's going to be different. Now, different is kind of a unique case because with different, we don't know if it's smaller than or bigger than it. We just know that it's different. So our alternative hypothesis, H1, is going to be that P doesn't equal the 0.52. That, that percentage, that proportion is different than what is stated. Again, we're not saying, we don't know if it's bigger than or smaller than, we just think that it's changed in the last five years. This is an example of a two-tail test. Because we don't know if it's different, we need to consider both the left tail and the right tail of our normal curve in our hypothesis testing. And the key word here that you wanna look for is the word different. Almost any time that you see the word different, that's going to indicate that we are trying to do a, a two-tailed test. And C. A study claims that the proportion of college students who suffer from anxiety is 0.11, but a statistics student believes that proportion should be higher. Well, my null hypothesis, H0, is that well, the proportion is 0.11. That's what a previous study claimed. And what the student wants to show then, what he wants to collect evidence towards, his alternative hypothesis, H1, is that that proportion is actually bigger than the 0.11. And because it's bigger, this is what we call a right tail test. So again, with the hypothesis testing, the first step setting up that null hypothesis and that null hypothesis is always going to be either a sample mean or a sample proportion equal to a specific value. And typically this is some previously measured value or a previous claim or a previous study. Uh, sometimes it is just you, you start with 50 50 because you don't really know. But again, typically there's some sort of previous claim that you're trying to, to well, see if there's an alternative to, and that is your null hypothesis. Um, now, we're only gonna be dealing with sample means and sample proportions. You actually can run your hypothesis testing using standard deviations and other things, but um, we don't really need to, to worry about that for this particular class. Our alternative hypothesis is always gonna be an inequality and it uses the same value from the null. And if you looked at those three previous examples, whether it was an average of 1,000 or a percentage of 52% or a proportion of 0.11, we use that same value both in our null and our alternative hypothesis. That alternative hypothesis is just going to have an inequality instead of an equal sign, which would either be less than, greater than, or does not equal, depending on what that researcher is planning to try to prove. Well, when we're doing our hypothesis testing, like everything else in the entire world, there's always a 
chance that it goes wrong. There's always a chance that we make an error. Now, at the conclusion of our hypothesis test, we're either going to retain that null hypothesis, meaning that there's not enough evidence to, to overturn what's previously accepted, or we're going to reject it. We do have sufficient evidence that we can reject our null hypothesis, that that null hypothesis was not true. The important thing to remember is that we can never actually prove the null hypothesis. That's not what we're trying to do here. We're just trying to find either evidence that supports the alternative or, well, maybe our evidence doesn't support the alternative. And like I said, there's always a chance that we make an error. There's going to be two types of errors when we do our hypothesis testing, a type one or a type two. A type one error is a false positive. That's when we reject our null when we shouldn't. That's when we say that, whoop, our evidence supports the alternative hypothesis. We should, well, therefore reject the null. But again, due to random chance, sometimes your sample is going to show that when necessarily it shouldn't. And that would be a type one error, is that false positive. A type two error is a false negative. That's when we retain the null when we shouldn't. So that means we collect our data at the end of the hypothesis test. Well, there's not enough evidence to overturn the null hypothesis. So we have to state that, well, the, there's not enough evidence to overturn the null hypothesis. However, in reality, if we had chosen a different sample or a correct sample, well, we should have overturned it. So really quick to, to hopefully make this a little bit more concrete, let's use some examples uh, from real life uh, with trying to understand what kind of error we're talking about. So with A, if the fire alarm goes off, but there's no fire. Well, if you're alerted to something that's not really there, that's a false positive. That would be a type one. That means the fire alarm went off, there's evidence that something is going on, there's evidence of a fire, except there wasn't a fire. We had a false positive. B, a Lyme disease test came back negative, but the person actually has the disease. And this is actually a very real scenario. And in fact, some doctors don't even test because the Lyme disease test is not accurate enough for them. But if it comes back negative and the person still has the disease, well, that's clearly a false negative, that it should have come back positive. We should have seen the Lyme disease, but again, it came back negative. So it did exist, the Lyme disease existed, but our test didn't show it. That's a false negative and that's the type two. C, we have a trail guide who gives the all clear but as soon as you take a step, there is a rattlesnake right in your path. What kind of error would this be? This is a type two. Again, this is a false negative. The, the, the guide said, nope, there's nothing here, right? Except there was, right? There, the, the test showed that there was something there, but it shouldn't have. And then lastly, the boy cried wolf when there was not a wolf. Well, that's definitely a false positive. That's a type one. The boy cried wolf, except the wolf wasn't really there. And so he claimed something that didn't really exist. To again, help with the, the, the conceptual part of doing a hypothesis test before we get into how we'd actually do this using actual data and examples, I wanna make a point that our justice system in the United States, our entire court system is actually based on hypothesis testing. The founders of this country set up our entire justice system based on hypothesis testing because this is the scientific method. This is how we can hopefully be correct as often as possible about not just scientific matters, but Again, in this case, also the innocence or guilt of a person. And so you've probably heard this, and if you've ever watched Law and Order, this is gonna sound really familiar, although I can tell I'm getting older because fewer and fewer students have seen Law and Order at this point, but imagine any kind of crime drama in a courtroom that you've seen. Um, you typically hear, you know, on any cop show or courtroom drama that every defendant is innocent until proven guilty. 
because that's your null hypothesis. Your null hypothesis has to be that everybody is innocent. It's literally one of the pillars that this country is founded upon. Every single person is innocent until there's evidence against it. So you're not allowed to illegally search people's belongings without, again, a, a cause to do so because that person has got to be innocent until he is actually, well, proven guilty by a jury of his peers or by a judge. And that's the prosecutor's job. The prosecutor's job is to provide that evidence of the alternative. So the alternative to being innocent is that, well, the defendant is guilty. That's the opposite. And it's the prosecutor's job to Again, collect the evidence and then present the evidence in a way such that the evidence shows that, well, it's very unlikely that our null hypothesis, it's very unlikely that the, that defendant is innocent. So, well, if that's the case, then he must be guilty. But getting into how we rate our conclusions here. After examining the evidence, the jury is either going to decide to reject the null, they accept the alternative hypothesis, there was enough evidence, and the defendant is guilty. However, if there's not enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, if there's not enough evidence to prove that they are not innocent, well then we say the defendant is not guilty. And you may never have even thought about that if you've seen lots of crime dramas. The jury never says the defendant is innocent because the jury can't claim the defendant is innocent because the jury doesn't know. The only thing the jury is instructed to do is state whether or not there was enough evidence to show that they're guilty. All right. Similarly, when we do our hypothesis testing, even if we can't reject the null, if we have to retain that null hypothesis, that doesn't prove that the null hypothesis is true. All right. We can't ever prove that the null hypothesis is true, and we want to make sure that we actually get that across in our conclusions. Now, going back to those types of errors, because the same thing happens in our criminal justice system. If our criminal justice system uses hypothesis testing, then absolutely those same errors are going to appear. So the jury is told to make their decision that the evidence shows guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. And so, Reasonable is a very, very important word in that statement because the jury can always make two types of errors. The type one error, and that's that false positive, would be they convict someone who's actually innocent. The type two error, which is the false negative, would be they let somebody guilty actually go free. And so what you really need is a nice balance, right? That word reasonable means you need a balance between requiring total and complete proof like DNA evidence and eyewitness testimony and closed uh, circuit television and all those other things but you don't always have all that evidence at your disposal if you needed only complete and total proof like video evidence of someone committing a crime and the DNA evidence to back it up well then you're going to make your type 2 errors quite a bit. You're going to let a lot of guilty people go free because at that level of significance, at that level of needing ev evidence, well, it's going to be very hard to reach that threshold. However, if a jury accepts weaker evidence, if they accept things like circumstantial evidence or just eyewitness testimony with no other evidence, well, then they're going to make the type one errors more often and they're going to convict someone innocent. And again, it's a very, very deep and meaningful question about what the word reasonable means in our justice system, because both of these types of errors are fairly significant. And again, this isn't a question I can actually answer for you about which is worse or what we should be trying to do, because that's your job as an adult now and a citizen of this country. But it is something that you should be aware of and make sure that you're actually taking time to think about, too. So let's go back to that level of significance. What do we mean when we need that type of proof? Well, with statistical testing, we can make it numerical, which is really, really nice. And the level of significance we give as alpha. And alpha is our probability of making a type one error. So the probability of making a false positive, that's what, that is represented with alpha. 
All right, and again, this is when we reject that null hypothesis when it's really true. That's that type one error. The probability of making a type one error and a type two error are related, as we kind of talked about with the criminal justice example. As one increases, the other is going to decrease. And they do this in an inverse relationship. Hint, hint, that's a homework question. But we've talked about alpha before, and it's the same alpha that goes along with our level of confidence. So our level of confidence and our level of significance are very, very much related to each other. Um, they're actually basically talking about two sides of the same coin. Now, when we do our statistical testing, that level of significance represents the probability. All right, and it's the level of probability that we set as the cutoff for our p-value. So alpha represents the area under the normal curve which also means that there's going to be that associated z-score. Again, going back to those previous chapters, right? Chapters eight, uh, well, chapter seven and eight. Every alpha has a, an associated z-score, and we can find that z-score using the inverse norm function on our calculator, and we call that our critical value. So the z-score that is associated with that alpha is our critical value. Now, for a left tail test or a right tail test, our area just equals alpha because we know we're in one tail or the other. For a two-tailed test, because we don't know what tail we're in, our area is going to be alpha over two. Remember, we have to divide it by two for our two tails, as we kind of mentioned in, in some of those previous uh, lectures. Now again, if this, well, if we hit our level of significance and we can reject our null, this is where the phrase statistically significant comes from. And so you want to be careful. Statistically significant does not necessarily mean what it feels like it should mean sometimes, because statistically significant simply means that, well, you, you've reached your level of alpha that you had chosen in the beginning of your experiment. So let's look at an example here. So a 2017 poll found that 44% of Americans wanted to repeal the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. A researcher believes that the percentage is actually going to be lower today. So she surveys 905 Americans and finds that 376 of them want to repeal that legislation. With the 5% level of significance, is there going to be sufficient evidence to support her conclusion? So again, typically the first step is to verify that the data is independent and approximately normal. My stat lab is not going to make you do this in chapter 10 because we've done this in previous sections, but if you were in a professional setting or you're trying to do statistical testing um, for, well, for anything besides my stat lab, you really do need to do this step first. So let's pull out all the data from this paragraph of information so that hopefully things become a little bit more clear. So let's see, X is going to be equal to 376 because that's our number of successes, and that's how many people wanted to repeal the legislation. Our sample size N was 905, that's how many people she asked. And so P hat, our sample proportion, our point estimate, would be, well, 376 divided by 905, which is approximately 0 0.415, if I'm rounding to three decimal places. Now remember that previous estimate stated that it should be 44%, or the proportion should be 0.44. So clearly her sample, 0.415, is smaller than 0.44. Her sample shows that 41.5% of Americans still want to repeal Obamacare, which is different than the 44% that was previously reported. However, because we've talked about this several times, our sample is going to be different depending on which 905 people we ask. Our sample could have a lot of random chance in there. So her sample is definitely smaller then, but it's not enough for her to claim that fewer people want it because we don't know what type of sample this is. All right, so we're gonna have to use probability and figure out, well, what's the probability that we arrive at 41.5% if we took a sample of 905 people. And, and is that statistically significant? We know that our sample is smaller, but again, is that sample being smaller due to random chance, or is it more likely that people actually feel 
differently. That's the purpose of our hypothesis testing. And, and that can be one of the harder concepts to really get across that, again, you did your sample, your sample shows that it's smaller, but again, is that random chance or is it because the whole country actually feels differently? Again, you didn't ask the entire country, you only asked 905 people. So, well, hypothesis testing is again, how we figure out whether or not that's meaningful. All right. And I have seen actually professional reporters who don't understand that concept and have falsely reported on many, many things without uh, relying on the hypothesis testing, which is why you want to be really, really careful about anything you read in the news or in social media about any sort of proportion or statistic. But now let's get back to that independent and approximately normal. So independent is easy. Remember independent just means your sample has to be less than 5% of your population. And clearly 905 Americans is less than 5% of that population. The approximately normal, remember that depends on whether we're dealing with a proportion or a mean. This is clearly a proportion. And so to identify that it is approximately normal and, and this part you actually might have to do on my stat lab, we need to use the N times P times one minus P being greater than or equal to 10. Now here's where I want to be very, very careful. And, and again, this is a common place to make mistakes. When we plug the numbers in, clearly N is N, but when we plug in P, I need to use what's previously accepted. Again, that goes back to that. I have to assume that my previous evidence is true. I have to assume that that is the case. I don't want to use P hat when I check that this is approximately normal. So again, plug all the numbers in, I get like 223 is, and clearly that's bigger than 10. That, that doesn't matter so much. I can check off approximately normal. I can check off that it's independent and I can continue on with my problem. Uh, again, just when you do the step, you have to use that previous proportion. Now, step two when setting up our hypothesis test is to actually set up that hypothesis test and, and specifically state our level of significance. So our null hypothesis in this case is, well, that the proportion is 0.44, right? 44% of Americans. So that's my null hypothesis. And what the researcher wants to show, her alternative hypothesis, is that that proportion is smaller than 0.44. Again, notice how we didn't use that P hat at all yet. Again, everything is just involving what is previously accepted. Now, because we are trying to show, or the researcher is trying to show that that proportion should be smaller, this is a left tail test. And again, it's a good idea to identify that too at the beginning. And then the last step is our level of significance. Well, we said with 5% significance, so that means alpha is really 0.05. Step three is really the, I guess, the mathy part of this, where we're actually doing a bunch of calculations. And so we're gonna have to find our standard error, and then we're gonna have to also still use our normal distribution and find our probabilities, which is really our p-value. Um, and so, well, the first thing we really wanna do is calculate our standard error, and our standard error for proportions are, well, found using that formula right there. Um, again, this is the same formula from chapter eight. One thing I wanna make a note of, see how Again, it uses P. Remember, all of my math up to this point should be using P because we have to assume that P is true until we can prove otherwise, which means we're using that previous result of 0.44, that 44%, when we calculate our standard error. And so again, just be really, really careful. This is the most common place or one of the most common places that people make mistakes because it's very, very easy to use P hat here um, because, well, right, that's what was just found, but no, we want to make sure we use P. And again, when we use that formula, we should get 0 0.017 as our standard error, which we're going to have to use, uh, well, several times, and we kind of keep going on with the math. Uh, the other thing we can calculate at this point is our test statistic, Z0, uh, which again is our Z-score which measures how many standard deviations away my data point is from the mean. So it's gonna be P hat minus P, right? How far away are we from the, the mean, right? How far away is our evidence from that actual mean? 
divided by our standard deviation. And again, we have to use our standard error here because we're dealing with a sample. And again, it's just a matter of plugging in all the numbers in the right spot. And again, we're using that standard error that we just found on the previous step. And so we find that our test statistic, our Z0 is negative 1.471, meaning that our data that we collected, if we assume that 0.44 is that median, our data would be 1.471 standard deviations away to that left-hand side. And from here, we just set up our normal curve. Um, we sketch it, again, it's a left tail test, so we're you know, shading to the left. My lower bound is then a, a large negative number. So again, a negative sign and type a couple of nines, is, that's sufficient, but again, just make it big enough. Our upper bound is up to our point estimate p hat, because again, we're doing a left tail test. And our mean is our p. Again, we have to assume that our me, mean is the, the proportion that was given, so 0.44. Our standard deviation is our standard error that we calculated in that previous step. And then again, once we plug all those numbers in, we let the technology calculate it for us, and we should get 0 0.0707 as our probability, which is our p-value here. All right. So step four is now I compare that p-value to my alpha. Or like I said, if we found our test statistic test statistic in terms of our z-score standard deviations, I can also find the standard deviation away for alpha. Um, again, go back to what we did in our previous chapters in chapter seven to do so. Um, but again, yeah, typically what we do is we compare the p-value to alpha. Which one of these is bigger? Is 0 0.0707 bigger or smaller than 0 0.05? Well, hopefully we see that the 0 0.0707 is bigger. That means my probability is bigger. My p-value is bigger. And if your p-value is bigger, we retain the null. Because what we're saying is that there was a roughly a 7% chance that our data came from just, well, random chance. There's, there's a 7% chance that we would just get that data just because of the randomness and the variability of the world we live in. And she had set her significance level as 5%, which again is the standard significance level in uh, the publishing world. And so even though our sample was smaller, and even though there's only a 7% chance that our sample came out of, well, random chance, because that 7% is still bigger than 5%, which was set as our cutoff from the beginning, we have to retain our null, which means when we state our conclusion, we want to state that with a 5% level of significance, there is not enough evidence to claim that the percentage of Americans who want the Affordable Care Act repealed is lower. There is not enough evidence. Again, our sample is smaller, but it's not enough evidence to actually state that anything has actually changed. And again, that can be a little confusing at first, uh, but focus on the process and try to think through these concepts too as you're working. For our last example, we're gonna look at the average salary of nursing graduates. So the average salary of nursing graduates is reported to be $57,500. A professor believes that the average should be different in Connecticut. And again, notice that word different, not less than or greater than, different. So he decides to survey 35 recent graduates from Connecticut and finds that their average salary is $60,000 with a standard deviation of 4,000. Is this going to be sufficient evidence to claim that the starting salary in Connecticut is different with a 1% level of significance? So again, clearly we see that the Connecticut average is bigger, but again, is that bigger due to random chance or is it statistically significant? Well, that's what our hypothesis test is going to help us to determine. So step one, verify that the data is independent and approximately normal. So first, let's actually pull that data out from our problem and, and kind of organize it in a much neater way than, well, a paragraph. So first of all, the average salary is reported to be the, is reported to be the 57,500. So mu is my 57,500. 
He surveyed 35 graduates, so n is 35, my sample size is 35. From his sample, he sees that the average of his sample is 60,000, so that's x bar, right? Your sample mean is x bar. And the sample standard deviation, s, is 4,000. So again, there's all of my data. So now it's independent and normal. Well, as always, independent is really easy because clearly 35 nurses is less than 5% of all nurses. And for the approximately normal, well, again, this goes back to are we dealing with the proportion or a mean? Well, uh, clearly this is a sample mean. And with sample means, the way we determine whether or not something is approximately normal is whether or not it satisfies n is greater than or equal to 30. Which, yes, 35 is bigger than 30, so it's going to work. Um, now, again, the problem might state that the population is normal to begin with, in which case you don't necessarily need to do that step. Remember, this step bigger than or equal to 30 is really that central limit theorem. If the data is normal to begin with, then, well, you don't have to check because it's stated to be normal. So step two, let's set up our hypothesis test, our level of significance. So the null hypothesis is, again, that previous data. So the null hypothesis, H0, is that the mean is 57,500. The professor thought it was going to be different. So his alternative hypothesis is that mu does not equal 57,500. Remember that different then means that this is a two-tailed test. And again, just as kind of a reminder for two-tailed tests, we're going to eventually use alpha divided by two. However, when we set up that test, again, alpha is still 0 0.01. It's only at the end, step four, where we're going to have to consider alpha over two. All right. So step three, again, all the calculations, find the standard error, and then we're going to use the t distribution. Remember, for sample means, we have to use the t distribution to find the probability of that researcher collecting her results. So let's start off with the standard error. And again, that formula for the standard error is the same one since chapter eight, where the standard error is going to be your sample standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. So again, just plug the numbers in, and we see that our standard error here is 676.123. And again, I'm just rounding to three decimal places. From here, we can find our t-score, right? That test statistic or our t-score, which is gonna be x bar minus mu divided by our standard error. So again, just plugging everything in. So that standard error, again, that becomes the denominator of this. And so we find that my t-score here is 3.698. All right. Now, I need to use the t distribution, which means I need to use the tcdf function. And so the tcdf function on your calculator, again, it's located under distributions. It's all in the same place, which is kind of nice. But because, again, um, sample size affects our t distribution, uh, what we need to do is actually consider our t distribution in terms of t scores. So our lower bound or our upper bound is actually going to be that T score, T sub zero, that we just found in the previous case. Now again, with our standard T distribution, uh, this goes back to the standard T distribution. So our mu at the center is zero. Again, we're going over in this case, remember that's our standard deviations really, 3.698 standard deviations. Um, now, even though this is a two-tailed test, again, that part comes in later, we see that our data point is to the right, so we are going to set this up as a right-tailed test, so my lower bound is that T0, my upper bound is a bunch of nines, DF, remember, stands for degrees of freedom, which is always N minus 1, and so if my sample size was 35, 1 less than that's 34, we type all of that in, and my calculator gives me this number. The 3.812 E negative 4. All right. Well, remember that E is really our scientific notation, which really means it's times 10 to the negative 4. And so if we go through and we actually um, convert that to a decimal, which we should, take the time to convert that to the decimal, move it over the four places, and there is my P value. The probability of obtaining these results would be 0 0.00038. Now we just have to compare 
our p-value to alpha, except remember, this is a two-tailed test, which means we have to use alpha over two. So when we do our comparison, we use alpha over two. So alpha was 0 0.01. We have to divide that by two and actually use that value for our comparison. So I compare my p-value over here, that 0 0.00038 to 0 0.005. Well, which one is bigger? Well, clearly the 0 0.005 is bigger. And if that is bigger, that means the p-value is smaller. The p-value is smaller in this case, which means we can reject the null. The probability of obtaining our results by random chance is really, really, really small. Again, it doesn't guarantee that we're right, but the chances of obtaining these results is so small if it was due to random chance that, yes, we can reject that null hypothesis. And so for my conclusion, I'm going to state that with 1% significance, there is enough evidence to claim that the average salary for Connecticut nurses is different than 57500 And again, when you write your conclusion, it's got to be based on what your original hypothesis was. All right. So I tried to walk you through the concepts a bit in the beginning and do some examples at the end. This section can take some work. So again, if you have any questions, please let me know and uh, good luck.